Well, that's the news from Arizona. Good place to be these days, too. Before we go to Tucson, the word from Phoenix, where today NFL owners were voted to allow, have voted to allow the St. Louis Cardinals to move to that city. It's the third franchise shift in the NFL in the past six years. The vote 26-0, Miami and the Raiders abstaining. Owner Bill Bidwell says the team will be called the Phoenix Cardinals. Hey, I know when I think of Cardinals, I immediately think of Phoenix. Tribe won their third straight today, beating the Brewers 8-4. Steve Crawford gave up all four runs, while Bill Cottle, Don Gordon, and Reggie Ritter all threw shutout ball. Joe Carter, a two-run homer, is third of the spring. Carmen Castillo added a two-run single. Tribe is now 7-6 and six in Cactus League play. They will host the Giants tomorrow. The Tribe has had some great players over the years, and some, like Rocky Colavito and Joe Charbonneau, were huge fan favorites. As John Tellish reports from Tucson, this might finally be the year when the town's most overlooked athlete finally gets the attention he has earned and deserves. Just east of downtown, nestled into the foothills of the Catalina Mountains, are developments with hundreds of expensive homes scattered about. It's where the elite of Tucson live. And I guess you could make an argument for the fact that Joe Carter is among the elite players not only in the American League, but in all of baseball. Joe joined the 30-30 club, the first man in tribe history, with 30 or more homers and stolen bases in one year. Three National Leaguers reached that level as well. You know, I can set my little sentence a little higher, maybe shoot for 40-40. Uh, you know, those are not uh, unrealistic goals. Many a fan dreads a summer without reliable Brett Butler in center field. But Joe Carter has shown already he can make the plays. It's a little bit tougher because you're into every play. You're involved almost every time backing up the other guys are uh, running balls and alleys. But I, I enjoy playing it. A nasty holdout in camp last spring set the tone for a disastrous campaign for the tribe. This spring, Hank Peters tripled Carter's salary. Uh, you know, I had no complaints. Uh, there, was, there was no animosity, no vendetta against the Indians or anybody in the front office. Uh, you know, I went out there, I was treated fairly this year, I signed. And, you know, that, that was all I wanted to be treated like last year, was, was treated fairly. In Tucson, folks think in terms of solar power. There's a long drive, left field. For the tribe, it's Carter power. John Tellich, News Center 8, Tucson. We all know the Cavs are young, but we all want to know when they're going to stop letting games get away in the final moments. Last night in New York, a perfect example of their losing their cool with a game on the line. The Cavs were down by two with time running out. Hot Rod Williams makes uh, a nice play to get the rebound, and here is mistake number one. Lenny Wilkins should have called a timeout to settle the team down. He didn't, so Mark Price walking it up. They're going to try to get the ball into Larry Nance, and they do, and it looked from there... Coming up right to Ronnie Harper now in the Nance. That they, they could have got the shot off right there, but back out to Ronnie, a poor shot. And what happens with 10 seconds left? Cartwright rebounds the ball, and the Cavs retreat, retreat down the floor. Well, finally, someone realized that, hey, perhaps maybe we should foul somebody. And when they did foul Mark Jackson, it was way too late. All the mistakes added up to the Cavs' ninth straight loss. It will most likely go to 10 in a row tonight when they play the Bulls in Chicago. Things are getting uh, tighter in the race for the final playoff spots as well. Indiana has number seven right now. The Cavs, the eighth and final spot. Washington is two and a half games back. The Knicks are now just a half game back of the Bullets. And the Cavs' once secure playoff spot is now anything but. March Madness gets underway on Thursday night. And by Sunday, they'll be down to 16. And even those that lose will win big. Each of the 64 teams will get a minimum $230,000. And those that go all the way to the Final Four in Kansas City will get $1.15 million each. In all, $32 million will go to the 64 schools. There is a report that the Illinois State CSU game will be televised locally. And it will if the remaining 3,500 tickets are all sold 24 hours before game time. That's Thursday night. If, in fact, the game does not sell out, there's no way the Vikes are going to host a second-round NIT game, even if they win. They got the home game because they sold out the hall last year. Again, 3,500 tickets still on sale. And coming up in today's Sports Extra, the Lady Cardinals of Shaw headed to Columbus for their fifth appearance in the Final Four of high school basketball. And despite an incredible record, they've never won at all. In the Extra, we'll take a look at their chances for the brass ring in this year's tourney. And finally, with the baseball season fast approaching, Here's a little something to test your skills and get you ready for the opener. Yanks and White Sox. Bobby Meacham at the plate. Sends a soft fly to left. Russ Mormon chases it down. And now watch real closely. Did he trap it? Is he out? Did he make a clean catch? Once more. Well, class, were we paying attention? 
Trapped What's it. the answer? Trapped it. Trapped. Yep. You're right, he did trap it, but he's out because the ump said he was. Trick question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Casey. Well, if you live in the southwest part of Greater Cleveland and thought you missed out on the lake effect snow that bombarded Ashtabula Monday, you probably woke up this morning and discovered that you were wrong. Our latest snowstorm shifted last night, dumping over a foot of snow south of the city in the Cleveland secondary snow belt. For folks here in Strongsville, as well as many other suburbs, the white stuff meant that the shovel was once again the order of the day. Hmm. Well, thanks to the snowy weather, few spectators bothered to show up in Hinkley today to watch the annual return of the buzzards. And New Center 8's Gary Stromberg says the foul weather kept down the number of buzzards as well. You know, a lot of people thought the 1988 Winter Olympics came to an end a couple of weeks ago. But wrong. There were still a number of events to be held here at Buzzard's Roost down in Hinkley. First, there was the buzzard calling contest. Here, buzzard. Followed by the buzzard begging competition. Come on, buzzards, anytime now. You see, legend has it the buzzards return to the Hinkley Metro Park like clockwork on March 15th every year. The weather is normally a little more spring-like, however, so today the Buzzard Winter Olympics had to be scheduled. On your mark, get set, go! The most hotly contested event was the Buzzard Decathlon. After a foot race, the competitors jump over or climb under a fence and start scanning the skies for a buzzard. The first Olympian to see one wins the gold. But thanks to all the flurrying, there wasn't much flying going on. What impact does all this snow have on this uh, buzzard arrival day? No buzzards. For a moment, we thought we spotted a buzzard taking part in the buzzard swimming competition. But actually, it was a creature that appeared to be part buzzard and part duck. I guess it was in the mixed doubles category. But where were the purebred buzzards? Do they normally fly in snow? I've never seen them fly in the snow. After some investigative work, I found out why the buzzard Winter Olympians were a no-show. They were being held captive at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. But apparently, one of their migrating cousins dodged the snowflakes and finally showed up at Buzzard's Roost shortly after noon, in time to keep the Buzzard Day tradition alive, but too late to capture a gold medal. Gary Stromberg, New Center 8. Well, I'd say from all that excitement, the Buzzards missed quite a show. <laughs> I don't know who's more excited. The <laughs> Rangers are waiting for them to get there. Uh, maybe uh, because it's leap year. They didn't look at the calendar. Oh. Maybe they're, gonna, they're a day Possibly late, like yeah. in 1984. Yeah. So they'll show up tomorrow and nobody will be there. <laughs> no one will be there, right. That's the way they want it. But a couple of weeks ago, we had a report of buzzards flying around the area. With all the snow cover now, feed the birds. And Robin, I mentioned last night <gasps> that a lady in Euclid called and a rufous or ruddy-sided Tohi was at her oh feeder my. weeks ahead of schedule. The males normally arrive first, establishing their territory. And my bird books tells me the Tohi often acts as a cripple to keep people away from the nest.